So in some sense, this is the diagram of the E. coli brain. It's a brain that's much simpler in, uh, than, than our brain, certainly, but it has the basic kind of core um, acting in the world in order to achieve a goal, and it does its job very, very well. And so it's sort of remarkable that we're getting to the point where we now uh, understand that sort of in totality an organism like this. And one can imagine that biology over the next few decades is going to apply the same level of detailed understanding to all, all organisms. And that will both be amazing in that we will understand the nature of, of biology much better. It will be great for medicine. And it's also a bit nauseating. Wow, we can look inside and see how this works. How are we going to feel if we have that same level of knowledge about how we work? So um, same thing with AI. Is it sort of gets on the boundary of, uh, as we get more knowledge, um, it's exciting and it's amazing, but it also shifts our own perspective of ourselves and the way that we got here. Yeah. What, what is your, uh, well, we're making great progress on that. And I'll say a little bit that as we go, um, there are um, means of scanning the brain as, as you're thinking about things. And they have very, very fine detail about where brain activity is. So we're starting to learn like what the different brain regions do. Um, we understand the neural connectivity pattern, but we don't really understand even the encoding of knowledge. We don't understand the way memories are stored. So it's sort of amazing that the brain has served. It's, it's, there are lots and lots of people working on it. It's huge advances. And yet the core things are not yet understood there. And so uh, various people have modeled computer power. And it looks like we'll have the computer power to simulate a human brain around 2019, something like that. And whether we know the algorithm, whether we know what to simulate is, is another question. Yeah? I'm wondering if uh, your definition of an intentional system, something that acts in the world in order to achieve a goal, yes. uh, is almost assuming a little bit of teleology, even if the goal is thrive long enough to reproduce. Yes. Well, it doesn't, it, in some sense, it's where teleology comes from. That um, you start with this universe, it doesn't necessarily, uh, necessarily have a purpose. And then uh, the process of, of replication, in some sense, uh, gives the natural selective thing. And, and it starts producing organisms which now do have a purpose. So the pattern keeps going in order to keep the pattern going. Exactly. And so this little guy has an amazing structure that enables it to, to fit in its niche. And so. Um, it's sort of on the edge. Our viruses are really on the edge between something, is it alive, is it not alive, does it really have a purpose? Clearly it doesn't have a conscious purpose, it doesn't know that it's doing this. Um, but as we'll, we'll see as we get along, uh, evolution has also produced uh, brains like ours, which can uh, model themselves and consciously think about and, and, and have true teleology. And so I think the emergence of teleology is one of the central interesting issues here. So there are a bunch of different time scales at which a change happens in these creatures. Um, the, the E. coli that I described and what I just showed you was sort of change on the physiological scale. That sort of changes in how many proteins there are inside of it, uh, how it moves its little flagella, that kind of stuff. That's very rapid, and that's happening all the time, and that's part of just the basic functioning. Um, the cognitive scale, which you, you were talking about, is sort of where you're thinking. Uh, that, that happens uh, slightly more s slowly than, than the physiological scale. The next up from that is a kind of is the ecological and uh, economic uh, scale at which transactions happen in the world. Uh, then the developmental scale at which um, organisms you know develop from a single egg up to a full creature for us maybe over you know 20 years or so. And then the evolutionary scale where we have changes uh, that uh, in our in our growth structure over over a long time. And in some sense, all of these scales, even though they look like very different processes. They're all trying to do something. They're all trying to meet the same goal in biology of, of uh, survival and, and replication. But they're happening at different time scales. So one thing I've thought about for years is, shouldn't there be a common theoretical framework where we can understand all these processes as, as sitting within? And in fact, there is. And I'll, I'll uh, describe it. It comes from uh, John von Neumann in the 1940s, um, who that was the time when they, they first developed uh, microeconomics, the foundations of microeconomics. And they ask the question, if you have um, a, a, a dynamical system, a, a physics, a set of rules about the way the world operates, and you have some goal, something that you want to achieve in that world, how should you best do it? And they discover that there's a simple algorithm. It's sort of a universal uh, optimal intelligence algorithm to achieve goals. Basically, what you do is uh, you consider all the actions you could take at this moment. 
you simulate, you maintain a model of the world, and you simulate the effects of taking that action. And you simulate it for all, uh, all time into the, into the future. And you see which action is most likely to lead to the goals that you, you want to solve. You take that action, you see what actually happens in the world, and you use that data to update your model. So it's an abstract, simple thing. You know, there's a formal mathematical structure, which the goals are represented by something called a utility function, a function over future histories that says how much you like one uh, over another one. Your beliefs, your model of the world, is represented by a subjective probability distribution, which says how likely you believe different outcomes will occur as a result of taking different actions. You act to maximize the expected utility, and then you update your uh, subjective probability distribution using Bayes' theorem. And so uh, this is sort of, in a, you know, five lines, it's the core mathematical algorithm that um, if, you, if you could implement that, um, it would be the optimal way of achieving any goal in any system. And so that's kind of amazing. Problem is, it's extremely expensive. This um, sort of uh, looking forward, looking at the consequences of taking a particular action, you have to look at the infinite future and you have to look at all possible ways that uh, what your effects that your action could take. This um, uh, maximizing the expected utilities, you have to compare all the different possible things you can do. And then finally, the updating your model of the world, that's a very, very expensive operation too. And so if you had infinite amounts of computational power, you could implement this and AI would be a solved problem. Um, you know, this does it. And also uh, biological systems could be you know, optimal in their world. And so in some sense, the whole tension, the whole subject of artificial intelligence from my point of view is how do you do this but with only a finite amount of computation, using only small amounts of memory, small amounts of, of, uh, of uh, computational steps. And biology has had the same structure, same, same issue. We saw that the E. coli, while it's pretty rich from a computational point of view, it doesn't have much room for state. It's, a, it's model of the world. The E. coli's view of the world is a pretty simple model of the world, and yet it has to be rich enough for it to do what it wants to do. Um, I think one of the most sort of interesting ways to see how this tr uh, can, can be traded off was one of the very first artificial intelligence programs, something by Arthur Samuel in the 1950s. He wrote a checker plane program that, um, from my way of thinking, is actually far more sophisticated than many of the other AI systems that have been built. Um, if you think about the game of checkers, you're trying to figure out which move to make in a given board configuration. And that optimal algorithm would say, you consider each possible move you could make, and then you consider all the possible responses to that move that your opponent could make then all your possible responses to that, and so on until the game ends. And for each move, you see which, which move um, will, will lead to a win for you. And so it's a perfect algorithm. It will definitely give you the very best move, but it's very, very expensive and not very tractable. Uh, though interestingly enough, just a couple of years ago, the game of checkers was solved using some clever techniques, but they basically took that ex um, extreme precise algorithm and showed that the first mover wins in checkers. Um, what Samuel's checker program did is instead of um, uh, searching the entire tree going forward, every possible response to every possible response, he only went a finite number of steps, you know, like maybe five steps forward, and then used an approximate model, a heuristic model that measured or estimated how good a board was, board position was, and um, backed that approximate model up the five steps forward that he's looking in time. So we truncate the search to only going a small number of steps forward. We use an approximate model, and then he updated the model using something called reinforcement learning so that um, it gets better and better through time. And so you could just directly use the model and say, pick the move that this model says is the best, but the model is approximate. It doesn't really work right. And so by, by searching forward a few steps using the model there and then updating it, he was actually able to produce a checker plane program that was one of the best in the world uh, for many, many, many years. So I think biology does a similar thing. It has this task of trying to take actions in the world that uh, lead to the outcomes that, that it wants, but it doesn't have enough computational power, doesn't have enough knowledge, doesn't have enough time to do the full algorithm that it needs to, and so it needs to approximate it. And we see that approximation happening at each of the time scales that I mentioned. And uh, in each case, the, the way, there's sort of three components. It has to have some mechanism for generating diversity. Uh, the, all the possible different things it might do. It has to have some way of choosing which of those things it wants to do, and it has to have some way of updating itself. So you can think of, here's like an example of some ants. 